want to continue talking in this series, The Life and Times of Jesus Christ. I want to speak today about the birth of Jesus. So open your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 2. And uh, it's interesting. Uh, how many of you had in Sunday school something about the birth of Jesus Christ today? You know what's amazing to me? I didn't know that. And that's great because that prepared you for the message. God had that all in his plan. And uh, as we come to this time today, it's also interesting that uh, Steve's wife, Sh Shelley, is with their daughter, and their daughter is with a new son that was born yesterday morning. His name is Adam. Is that correct? <laughs> anyway, it's wonderful, and that's where Shelly is, and I imagine Grandma's not going to be anywhere else before that baby is. She happens to be an obstetrics nurse at Riverside Community Hospital. I'm thinking she is perfectly equipped and trained for this. How wonderful. Well, we're going to be uh, standing to read Luke 2, and I'm going to be re begin reading at verse 1. And um, so... Uh, Let's pray for the Lord to speak to us. There's a lot of things to learn from this passage. Father, please speak to our hearts. Help us to see and understand the wonderful lessons that you have for us in your word. And I pray, Father, that when we leave this place, we'll be glad that we have looked into this passage a little bit deeper and in a different way than perhaps we did before. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in Luke chapter 2, verse 1. I'm going to read the first part of this passage. And it says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, and this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger, and suddenly... There was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. You may be seated. The life and times of Jesus. The life and times of Jesus, you know, his life began before the world was created because it was by him and through him everything that exists was created. 
and is held together. But this is the birth of Jesus Christ in the flesh. It's when God came and was born in the flesh. And I want us to take a look at a few, few thoughts here that I got out of this passage. The first one is, God is in control. Now in the times in which we live today, it would seem like nobody's in control. Everything is in chaos. People are doing whatever they want to do in their own eyes. There is lawlessness. There are leaders that you don't know if you can trust what they say or not trust what they say. And uh, everything seems like it's out of control. Do not allow yourself to be sucked into that kind of thinking. God is in control. It doesn't mean that he that all people always obey God. And even when it doesn't feel like God's in control, remember, he's still sitting on the throne and everything is happening on his schedule and you don't have to worry. Has God lost control because of the things that are going on around the world? And, it, and when in this passage, when it says it came to pass in those days, what it means is it came to pass was something that had been prophesied years and years before had now come to pass. Things that God had intended to happen were happening now at the perfect time. And this perfect time was this decree that went out from Caesar Augustus. And I wanted to just give you a little information about who is this guy, Caesar Augustus? Why is it so significant? And it says also something about Quirinius governing Syria. The first slide I have up here is a slide of Caesar Augustus. And uh, it says up here in 44 BC he was adopted. He was adopted posthumously. I don't know how that was arranged, but uh, it was actually done that he, he was adopted by none other than his great uncle Julius Caesar. What had happened to Caesar? Remember, he was assassinated. And even his assassination led to the posthumous adoption, that was, must have been his intention in writing to adopt this young man, uh, Augustus. And uh, so they fulfilled his wishes and they adopted him legally, did the paperwork, and he then became in succession as to become a leader in, in, uh, in Rome. In fact, he was the founder of the Roman Empire. And this is important because during his reign, I'm going to show you a map, what he accomplished in the conquering of almost all the nations around the Mediterranean and the beginning of the construction of the Roman roads, which enabled them to transport information and people all throughout all of uh, Europe, all the way to Great Britain, all the way around Northern Africa, and even uh, the western part of Asia. So because this man, because Julius Caesar was assassinated and this man was put in place, everyone might say, everything's out of control. Everything's out of control. Julius Caesar's been killed. But Julius Caesar already had been led to make a plan so that this man would be placed in position to found the Roman Empire. Now let's keep going. This is a map. On this map shows in green all of the nations, some of which were already under Roman control, but all of these areas in dark green were conquered by Caesar Augustus because he ruled from 30 BC until 14 AD. He ruled for 44 years. And he and another guy, Mark Anthony, you might have heard of him, and another guy got together and they, these three, formed a triumvirate and they went after the assassins of Julius Caesar and consolidated their power throughout the, what, is, what we know as the Roman Empire. And so all of this area was uh, conquered by him except this little light area here and over here east of Nazareth and Jerusalem and over here which is now Iraq. All this area, that was conquered by Trajan who conquered it and then he was defeated and lost it. Okay, so, but all the dark part was, was by Caesar Augustus which enabled the spread of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ over all these roads that were created, and he established something called Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome. 
which established rules so that a citizen of Rome could not just be uh, killed, he had to be taken and tried and at his request could be taken to Caesar. Guess how that led into the gospel? That meant the apostle Paul, being a Roman citizen, would be able to be taken to see the emperor in Rome. All this was God's doing. There's no doubt in my mind it's amazing. All this happened. And oh, the guy Quirinius, he was actually the governor of Syria. He was the governor of Syria twice. Once before uh, dur and during the time when uh, Jesus Christ was born. And then another time a few years later between AD 6 and 7, he was also the governor of Syria again under Roman rule. And so uh, things were not real stable around there, but I just wanted you to know uh, all these guys are real people in the Bible, and they were all there by God's purpose and intention. And uh, when we think about control, the control that God has, uh, I want you to know that God is so in control that he caused this emperor to declare a decree that all the people would be registered so he would know how many people are in the empire and how he could establish a, a base of taxation for all the people in the empire. So that caused Joseph and Mary to travel before Jesus was born, while she was pregnant with the, with the Christ child, travel from Nazareth all the way down to Bethlehem, the city of his lineage, which was the house of David, which was about 80 to 82 miles on the roads uh, that they had to travel while she was pregnant and almost ready to deliver a child. If you're having trouble getting the, the labor started, I, I suggest if you ride a donkey for 82 miles, it will get things going. And uh, so Mary got down there to Bethlehem, and the next thing you know, she needed to be in a place where she could deliver the Christ child. That also was interesting. That didn't happen halfway to Bethlehem or 10 miles outside of Bethlehem. She got all the way to the city. When she got to the city, and there was no place for them. They were probably put into a stable, uh, a, a cave perhaps. It was used as a stable for, for Roman horses. And she was deli delivered of the Christ child, the child of God, the Son of God. And he was laid to rest after being wrapped in the strips of cloth. He was laid to rest in a feed trough, a manger. The Bible calls it a manger. A manger is a feed trough. So all this is interesting to me because what it says is God is in control and what was prophesied 700 years earlier happens precisely at the right place at the right time with the right righteous mother a poor mother and the father being God himself interesting and the son of God became flesh he already had existed as God before this but now he became born in the flesh of a man. And I was thinking about all of this. This is a fulfillment of a need. Since Adam, the first Adam, not Steve, not the baby, but since the first Adam who sinned in the garden and since God had put a curse upon the whole earth and upon all living creatures for mortality, that the wages of sin is death, since that time the earth has been groaning and waiting for a Redeemer to come. And at the right time, God being in control, even though it didn't look like it, His Son is born in Bethlehem to become our Savior. And uh, I want us to look back at this passage. By the way, this is where they traveled from, from up here in Nazareth, which is just west of the Sea of Galilee. Here's Mount Carmel here. This is Nazareth. And you see this mountain ridge that comes down and it comes here. Jerusalem and Bethlehem are up in the mountains. So for them to get from here, which is down in a valley, all the way down to here, they had to travel a road 82 miles going through mountainous terrain to get to Jerusalem and then 10 more miles to Bethlehem where the lambs were being raised for sacrifice at the temple. Anyway, Abraham... Abraham, and by the way, what was I going to say? That Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, he laid it upon Isaac his son, he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they both went together. And Isaac spake to his father, Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, son. 
And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, this is a prophecy, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. The fulfillment of the promise Abraham made to Isaac was fulfilled more than a thousand, about 1,500 years or so later when Jesus was born. God is in control even when it does not look like it. The night when Jesus was born was the night not only when the promise was fulfilled, but when our Redeemer was born, came into this world. And so God sent His Son into this world. His birth is, I think, one of the most amazing things that's ever happened in all time. The birth of God Himself, to be born in the flesh. God, all-knowing, all-powerful, present everywhere, eternal God, to come from the glory of heaven and to humbly cast off the visible appearance of the glory of God and to be born in the flesh and to limit himself to be in one place at one time while he was in that flesh for the next 33 years. That's humility. That is uh, amazing to me that God would do this for you and for me. He did it for our benefit. The Messiah was born, as I said, the right location, the right series of events had to happen. God was absolutely in control. So Micah 5.2 is one of the prophecies that's fulfilled here. It says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth are from old. He was born, but he was already old in our terms, from everlasting, from eternity past. And that was known to all those who studied and knew the scripture. Remember when the Israelites, because of their refusal to repent and to obey God in about 700 years before Christ, when all the prophets started warning, if you don't repent, then God's going to send you into captivity. If you don't repent and return back to God, he's going to put you into, all these enemies are going to come in and take you captive. And we know the Assyrians did it, and then the Babylonians did it, and some of them went from Jerusalem to Babylon and there in the east they took scrolls, copies of the Old Testament and these prophecies including Daniel because wasn't Daniel one of the captives taken when he was a boy? Yes. He was taken into captivity and while he was there in captivity copies of the Old Testament prophecy were left in the east. Scholars in the East read these prophecies. They were aware of them. And when they saw the star over Bethlehem in the West, from their perspective, they came. It, and so, uh, after Matthew 2 says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Now, he was not the emperor of the Roman Empire. He was king of this province. And behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. They were only wise because they had read the scripture and believed it, the Old Testament prophecies. So they were coming to fulfill these prophecies. And they came from to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? The guys in Babylon or in that area somewhere in the east, Persia or Babylon, they were looking for the prophecy to be fulfilled. What is absolutely not understandable to you and me today is why weren't the Jewish scholars and priests, why weren't they just as aware and just as much looking forward to the birth of the Messiah and when he was born, they should have noticed it. They were there. In fact, in Jerusalem, they were only 10 miles away from where the Savior was born. I wonder how many of the citizens of Bethlehem were aware that on that night, the Messiah was born. Was anybody aware? Were any of the neighbors of that house where he was, where he was born, where they, in the stable where he was born, were anybody aware that he was being born in a stable? 
and that the Messiah was going to be laid in a feed trough, a manger, I don't think they were aware yet these guys in the east came all this way. It was a huge travel they had to go across there. And they said, where has he been, been born? King of the Jews, we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. Folks, that is so stupid. He should have been excited that the Messiah is born to save us. Instead, he got troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, you know, as the leader goes, everybody else follows in the folly. And when they had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So the scribes, who knew the scripture, but didn't apply it, said, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it's written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, that's in Micah, the prophet, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Caesar was still ruling when Jesus was born, Caesar Augustus. But God was overruling. God's plan is accomplished. And by the way, has God changed? And changed. So that means that God still rules, He is still in control, and He still overrules the best laid plans of mice and men. Mice and men. <laughs> At least men. And I don't know if mice plan, the men mice plan, they're pretty uh, difficult to get rid of. God worked out all the details so Jesus might be born where the prophets wrote that He would be. If the Lord could do that and work out a plan that He promised really to Adam, and then repeated it to Abraham, and then he repeated it through all the prophets. If he could cause that to happen at the right place, at the right time, in the right circumstance, and his son be born, do you think he knows about your problems? Is it possible that God could actually handle any problem that you have? Yes, for sure. Another thing I want to talk about is this. Jesus is not a poor little baby today. Sometimes we get this image because of all the commercialism of supposed to be Christmas. It's not even, it's not remotely like the birth of Christ anymore. And we have so many messages that have been put out about the Christ child, the Christ child, the Christ child. Well, he was born as a child, but he grew up to become a man. And he didn't remain as a little infant. He is fully God. He's not a little baby. He's God, who humbled himself to be born in the flesh, but he's fully God, the God-man, fully man, fully God. And it says uh, he was to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife. The betrothed wife there is not necessarily in some uh, manuscripts. It just says his betrothed, which makes sense. He was engaged to her, but they had not yet completed being married, and he had never been with her. Mary, and uh, Mary was pregnant with the child of God, the Son of God. So it was while we were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and uh, verse 7 says, And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, laid him in a manger, there was no room for them in the end. I'm thinking if they had been wealthy, somebody would probably have been pushed out, and they probably could have had a room in the end. But because they were poor, there was no room for them in the end. And our Savior's entrance into this world, I think, was the most humble thing, that he came to be born in the flesh. And he was born in a humble place. And he was born through a poor woman, but a righteous woman. And when Joseph and Mary arrived in Bethlehem, there was no place for them to stay, but they found refuge in the place where they sheltered the animals. And when Mary delivered the child, she placed him in a feed trough. But before she did, she wrapped him in strips of cloth. That would be the swaddling cloths. That was the practice they did at those days. They'd take these strips of cloth and wrap them around the baby to protect the baby, keep the baby warm and so forth, uh, keep him from harm. That was their practice. And I was thinking, even when Jesus was born, it was a picture of his death. Because the same kind of cloths that are wrap, wrapped around a baby is the same kind of strips of cloth that would be wrapped around a person's body being prepared for burial. When Jesus was born, he came to die for our sin. He came knowing he was going to give his life 
for you and for me. And that also says to me, God's in control. There's no accidents or coincidences in the life of any child of God. People say, well, it was just an accident or coincidence. I want to say, not necessarily. Sometimes God allows things to happen in our life to bring us to a place where we'll grow more or admit our need and dependence upon God or where we'll learn something that we need to learn in order to become a more complete Christian, a child of God. And so Mary took this baby, put him in the manger, and uh, this feed trough where he, where he was placed, I think, is also part of the whole picture because he came to be our bread of life. And so the feed troughs where he fed the animals, but when the Son of God was placed into the manger, the trough where they used, which was used to feed grain to the animals, he came basically also not only to die, but to satisfy the hungering soul of man. It was appropriate that he was born in Bethlehem because you know what Bethlehem means? It means house of bread. <laughs> He's the bread of life who was born in a city called house of bread, Bethlehem. <laughs> and uh, laid in this manger. So my question for you is this, are you hungry? spiritually hungry. If you're spiritually hungry, then you need to go to the one who is the bread of life because he can satisfy you so that you won't hunger spiritually the rest of your life. Never. He satisfies a hungry soul. Look at Psalm 107 verse 9. It says, For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. That's because Jesus is the bread of life and I'm not making it up. John 6.35 says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst because he's also the source of living water. He's the source of life. In fact, I say in my Bible a lot of times, I'll say, my Bible contains words of life. That's what my Bible has. It's words of life. And I'm so grateful for it because I'm hungry for spiritual feeding. I'm hungry and thirsty to be nurtured in the Bible meets every need that I'll ever have in my life. So the people in Bethlehem, I think, were absolutely unaware of what was going on, or they'd have been over there around the house when the shepherds got there. And uh, by means of angel, an angel, God revealed the news, and he didn't reveal it to the religious leaders in Jerusalem, or the king, King Herod, or call together the Romans, or go to the emperor, emperor and say, in your empire, the Roman Empire, there's being born the Messiah who's going to save everyone from sin. No, he went to the shepherds. You know what the shepherds were doing? They were out there at night taking care of their sheep. Probably several flocks gathered together on the hillsides of, of, around Bethlehem, the city, and they were taking care of and protecting their sheep. And you know what they were raising these sheep for? They were raising them to be taken to the temple to be offered as sacrifices there. I want you to think that when they were told that the Savior's being born, the one who would be sacrificed once for all, for all sin, for all mankind, forever, this meant they would be put out of business. And they didn't even think about that. They just went to Bethlehem to see the good news. And that's amazing to me that the shepherds did that because they were guys who were always out there taking care of the sheep. Anybody here ever, here ever milk cows? Milk cows. How many days a week do you have to milk cows? Huh? Eight. Seven, seven days a week. Every day you got to milk the cows. If you don't milk the cows, you got a problem. And the cows have got a bigger problem. So the shepherds were in a similar situation. They could not leave the sheep out in the field to the wolves and go into the temple to worship, to offer sacrifices, to be cleansed of their sin, forgiven of their sin. They had to stay out in the fields with the sheep all the time, seven days a week. So people didn't look upon them very well. They were unwashed. They were pretty rough guys. They didn't get into, into, into Jerusalem hardly ever to to uh, worship or to uh, make an offering, a sacrifice to cover their sin. They were out there. So people looked down on them because they were not able to go to, we'd say go to church, but they weren't able to go to the temple. 
And so uh, they were looked down. And it's interesting that the Lord came, sent an angel to these humble outcasts who were out there doing an important task for everybody else, serving the needs of everyone else, providing sacrifices for everyone else. And he went to those guys, the guys that were not able to go to, to the big city of Jerusalem and were out in the country. And uh, that's the way Jesus is. Look at Philippians 2. Verse 5 through 8 says, Let this mind be in you, which also was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man. Jesus humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. There's a scripture in the Old Testament that says that, that uh, Moses is the meekest man that ever walked the face of the earth. And I'm sure that's true. But the meekest person in the universe is Jesus Christ. Amen. Anybody who would humble himself this much, it's only Jesus. He's the only one. Even to the death on the cross. Jesus made everything, but he had almost nothing. You know why he came? He loves you. He loves you in spite of your sin. Jesus Christ has a plan for you and for me, and he wants you to know you can trust him. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9 says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. You know, you might not be rich in material things, but you can be rich spiritually. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are rich because all the riches and heavenly places in Christ Jesus are reserved for you. You're rich spiritually. And there's nothing in the world that could compare to being spiritually saved, at peace with God, knowing that there's reserved for you in heaven someday a beautiful place to live. It's got your name on it. There won't be a no vacancy sign when you get to heaven. Look at Hebrews 4 verse 15. It says, we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. Jesus no, understands our weakness. God understands perfectly how weak we are. But he was, Jesus was, in all points tempted, such as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Did you have to notice the theme of the songs that Steve led us to sing this morning? Wonderful grace of Jesus, grace greater than our sin, amazing grace. <laughs> I was looking at these songs and thinking, is there any more powerful grace message anywhere than the message that God would humble himself and give himself to save us from our sin? That has got to be the most powerful, pure demonstration of the grace of God that God would give His Son to save us, unworthy ones. So Jesus was born. He was placed in the manger. He was not born in a palace. If He had been born in a palace, could the shepherds have just gone into the palace and gone in to see the baby? No. So He was born in a place which was accessible even to the shepherds, which is it had to be just a very humble place. He was born really in poverty. And that says something. If the shepherds could go to see Jesus, even I can go see Jesus. Even you can go see Jesus. There is nobody that's too low or too poor or, or the wrong whatever to say, I can't go and see Jesus. Jesus is for everybody. He is accessible to anyone who will come unto him. The scriptures even tells us that. It says, whosoever comes unto him, he will in no wise cast out. And, but he's not a poor baby. He's God. And he's the creator of everything that exists. Now, don't be afraid. There's a lot of things in this world that cause us to have fear. But you can rejoice because we have a Savior. No matter how bad it gets, I have joy because I have a Savior. He says, there were same, in the same country shepherds living out in the fields keeping watch over the flock by night. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. 
that I would be afraid too. If I was out in the boondocks and I was with just nothing but a bunch of sheep and up shows an angel, an archangel of God in the night with all the glory I'm sure that it was uh, pertaining to being an angel who stood in the presence of God. He comes and stands there. These guys are scared literally almost to death and the glory of the Lord says uh, it sh shones around them. That's why I'm telling you that I think it was bright. And they were probably almost blinded by the glory of the, that surrounded this angel. And the angel says, don't be afraid. Man, that had to be good words. Don't be afraid. Whew. Don't be afraid. And, and then he gives them, he gives this message, because I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. There's born to you. Every word's important. Born to you this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That means Messiah, the Anointed One. And this will be a sign you'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. <laughs> I got to think, because an angel delivered it and was, was surrounded by glory, and I'm, and I'm sure I'd be convinced this was not just another shepherd, this was an angel of God, then I'd be going there saying, really? The Messiah is born and he's in a feed trough? Really? And so they went and suddenly, to confirm what he just said, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And so these guys who worked so hard uh, raising sheep for the slaughter out in the country, not really welcomed by most people, didn't even think about it. They just left the sheep there and took off and went into town to see the baby. <laughs> and as they went in and they saw the baby, he had told them, don't be afraid. And he told them what to look for when they got there. You'd find a baby wrapped in a swaddling cloth lying in a manger. That was a sign to them. Again, fulfilling prophecy and ensuring that the shepherds wouldn't go to the wrong house, the wrong baby, whatever. They had to know it was the right one. They had the sign there, the baby in the feed trough, wrapped in swaddling cloths. And I have to say, because the world had been in the grip of sin for thousands of years, even to the shepherds who didn't get much chance to go into town to the temple, this had to be good news. I mean, really good news. It had to be great news because it's finally the answer God has sent the Messiah and the Savior to us. He said to you, to them. When you know Jesus, and if you do know Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's your responsibility and mine to tell people the good news. It says it was when the angels had gone away from them to into heaven, and they all left, and the shepherds, and by the way, that word means they gradually left. It didn't mean they suddenly left. It meant they gradually left. And I'm thinking as they were leaving and as they were saying these things to them, this glory to God and so forth, I think the angels were testifying to the Savior, to the Messiah as they left. It wasn't a sudden. It was gradually leaving. And as the angels were leaving and going back into heaven, they were bearing a witness and a testimony that the Savior had been born. I don't think this happened just in a moment. I think this, because of the, 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 uh, the tense of the verb there, that, that, that it was a gradual thing. And then it says, and they came in haste. As soon as they left, they went and they hurried to town. They found Mary and Joseph and the babe. Bethlehem was not a very big city then. It was a little town. And when they could see